first Sunday of Advent. And I wonder how many times you may have said or heard somebody say over the past week, I can't believe it's December already. Wow. Well, there's a number of announcements that I'd like to highlight with you. If you did not were able to pick up an announcement sheet, they're right on the stand in the back. Feel free to grab one on your way out. But there's a, several things that I've been asked to give attention to, and that is for those persons who uh, focus on year-end giving, that giving would have to be submitted by December 15th to be processed before the end of the year. Because I know a lot of people give at the end of the year for income tax purposes. You want to make sure that that's accredited that way. And thank you so much for all of your support. Also, our J term begins on January 7th. And we're working with the book, The Secret Power of Kindness. So messages over five Sundays are going to focus on some of the themes of that text. And then Pastor Sarah and I are both going to be teaching a study on that text and scripture references around the issue of kindness. It is identified as one of the fruit of the Spirit, but there's a whole lot in scripture regarding this topic. So Pastor Sarah's session is going to be on Wednesdays from 3.30 to about 5. And mine's going to begin at 7.15 to about 8.30. So you've got a late afternoon and an early evening session. Uh, confirmation is also going to begin on January 3rd. And if you're interested in confirmation, uh, feel free to contact the church office. You can register your teenager there. I'll be teaching confirmation this year, and there's several others going to be joining with me in teaching that. We have an absolute blast sharing the good news of God with our confirmands. And our biblical focus for confirmation is we read through the entire book of Mark. So we've got 16 chapters on 16 weeks of confirmation. And we just parse it out and dig deep on what the Lord has revealed through this one particular gospel, which is the shortest gospel of all and the first one written. Just one more announcement that I've been asked to clarify, and that is the jingle mingle. If many of you remember when we had a congregational dinner here, potluck, covered dish dinner here a couple months ago, uh, we had to set up extra tables extending from one side of the wall to the other to contain all the food. And if you remember, we had to set up extra tables that were in the round because we had 168 people that attended that covered dish. Well, we've got another one coming up on December 10th, and you'll notice in the announcement that it begins at 5 o'clock. So you might want to circle your calendar on that. We're really excited to be able to share another covered dish meal together. We're going to be singing a lot of carols that night, too. Well, God is good, and it is recorded in the prophet Isaiah, Arise and shine, for your life has come, and the glory of our Lord rises upon us. Would you stand and welcome one another this day with a hug or a handshake, greeting one another in the name of the Lord. family to come who's going to be sharing with us the very first lighting of the Advent candle. Excel and uncertainty, the prophet Isaiah cried out, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name, a name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down, and the mountains trembled before you. In the midst of our own encounters with uncertainty and upheaval and our longing for deliverance, 
Jesus calls to us, therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come. Mark 13, 35. We light this candle as a sign of our shocking hope. We may stay awake to God's activity in the world as we wait in expectation that even now God is with us, working to restore us to a fullness of life with God and one another. Amen. We invite you to stand with us here as you're able as we sing. Is in awe of who you are. 
You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and Savior forever. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. For we sing of God. God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us, oh God with us, oh God for us, nothing can come against, no one can stand between us. Son, the Holy Spirit, for eternity we will sing of all you've done. Come on, lift it up. We in the form of Jesus the Christ. God, this morning we think of Mary, who is the 
is the picture of the one that allowed it to, to happen in herself, to have this divine love. Come forth, God. And so we allow this to happen in our own selves. That through our actions, through the ways that we interact with others, we would allow your love to be birthed and, and to come into this world in new, in new ways. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Well, I didn't even get a chance to say anything yet. Now? Well, okay. If there's any young ones out there that would like to come on up and get really close to where the puppets are. So I have Calamity, yes, with me today. So feel free to come on over and have a seat on the floor here. In fact, I'm coming down. You are? Yeah, I am. I get a little closer. Okay. Hi, kids. No, don't run away. Okay. Well, um, this is the first day of Advent. Yeah. And do you know about it? I don't like your face. You don't like my face? Well, not your face, your scruff. My scruff. Well, what about your scruff? It's real. Well, so is mine. Oh. Who walks up to somebody and says, I don't like your face? I'm sorry. Okay, well, I just didn't shave for a day. <laughs> wow, that's impressive. Yes, I think so. That's not true. Yeah, you're exactly right. But you asked the question. Yeah. Um, Advent. You want to know about Advent? I want to know about Mary. Mary? Yeah. Well, uh, Mary is the mother of Jesus. Yes. And um, so Joseph's the dad, right? Well, yes and no. What? Well, the Holy Spirit is actually the dad. Did uh, Mary's dad buy into that? Well, <laughs> I don't know whether he bought into it or not, but that was the truth. And Joseph raised Jesus and took Mary to be his wife. Thank God for Mary. Yeah. I'm amazed. I'm amazed, too. It's a powerful story. Do you kids know the name Mary, mother of Jesus, and Joseph? Joseph, Mary's husband, father of Jesus? Yeah, that's really cool. Yes, it is very cool. And they were a holy family. Like ours. Yeah, a little different than ours, but yes. Yeah. Like theirs. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. We're celebrating the birth of Christ. Advent is a time of waiting. I don't like to wait. I know you don't, but waiting is a part of life's journey. Okay. All right. Uh, so it's a time of waiting. And Did I tell you I don't like the wait? Yes, you told me you didn't like the wait. It's a time of expectation. For the Christ is coming. And Jesus will be coming. We celebrate his birth on when? Christmas Day! <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, but Jesus is with us always. Yeah. So do you think we ought to pray with the kids? Uh-huh. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. I will too. Okay. So that we're not looking around at stuff, you know, lights and things like that. But we're just focusing our attention on God. Okay. Are you going to pray? I'll pray. All right. Well, Lord, thank you for these kids. Thank you for our families. Thank you, Lord, for Advent. In anticipation of the arrival of the birth of Jesus. And we acknowledge that he was born son of Mary. And lived among us and gave his life for us that we might know God and know through Jesus salvation, which is a free gift. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. And we kids all agree saying, amen. Okay, you can return to be with your folks. See ya. Anybody want to give Calamity a hug? Oh, yeah. Oh, so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Any other hugs? Any other hugs? Anybody want a hug? See ya. <laughs> See ya.
How come you didn't jump in there and say, yeah, I'd give calamity was, a hug? I was What's your problem? Kids that went back <laughs> I just away. don't know what your problem is. I thought you were right there. Uh, we're going to continue with the presentation of our tithe and offering. It's an opportunity to honor the Lord in our giving. And we thank God for how he has blessed all of us in so many ways. And through the ministry of our congregation, the children's ministry, I have heard that there were over 200 kids here yesterday to celebrate the miracle of Jesus. And just a blessing on so many different levels. We thank God for our children. We thank God for our most senior citizens. We thank God for our faith family. We invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive our offering. You heard the cry of our hearts. And you came down. Freely you gave us your love. Show Yeah. 
scheduled to go to Country Meadows, and she got COVID, so can't seem to catch a break. Uh, until she's beyond that, she won't be able to move into the nursing home facility, but we pray that that will occur for her soon. I want to pray for um, Dick Broombaugh. We call him Broomy. He's the oldest male member of our congregation. He's 98, and he's seated in the last pew of the sanctuary today. Always get a chance to connect with him and laugh with him. And he is so thankful, he says, to be standing up. He's just got a great sense of humor. He's a great man. And we pray for Broomy today. We also want to pray for my mother-in-law, Jan, who a lot of you know, and for my mom. They've had a, Both of them have had a really difficult last couple weeks. And my wife, Ann, is down in uh, the Philly Hospital now with her mom, probably down there through midweek. So we pray that uh, these two women of faith, that we could lift them up before the Lord. We've had some significant loss within our congregation. Uh, we've been praying for Susan Pickett in light of her husband's sudden passing. We pray for the Ron Jones family in light of Ron's passing. We pray for Katie Gallagher and her family in light of her mother's passing. But there have been deaths over the last number of months that just like a knot in the stomach for a lot of our families because we're coming into this very celebrative season of the year and it's felt. So if you know of persons who have had difficulty with experiencing loss, keep them in your prayers. And we will do that here today with people that we know as a congregation have passed into glory, praying for their families. Let's pray together. Lord, we're very grateful that we can lift these concerns before your throne of grace. We begin with Mary Jane Williams, Lord, asking for you to bring healing to her, to move beyond COVID and to strengthen so that she can have some restored mobility and return or be, be placed in country meadows where she's looking forward to being able to find residence there. We pray for others that we know are struggling physically, my mother-in-law Jan, my mom Edith, and others that we would add to that list that are experiencing some hard times, some rough physical issues. And there's some mental health issues that we know of people that are contending with as well. And Jesus, thank you for your healing touch. Thank you for the peace that you bring to us and to others as we call upon you, as we lift those that we love and care for very deeply before your throne of grace. Lord, we want to pray specifically uh, for the Jones family, for the Pickett family, uh, for the Gallagher family. Pray, Lord, in light of recent loss that you as their chief healer would bring the comfort that they so need to envelop them with those arms that never let go, and they don't. And we thank you for this, Lord. We pray for a number of families in our congregation that have experienced loss in recent months, that during this heightened, celebrative season of the year, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you and turn to you and thank you for life lived with these persons. But the hardest part of love is letting go, and we all understand that, Lord. And so we entrust these persons and their spirit into your care. We just ask for your comfort and your strength. Lord, we want to pray for Broomy. Uh, thank you for this man of faith who is living legacy within our congregation, Lord. And we pray that you bring healing to him as he sits in worship in our traditional gathering this day. What a joy. So thank you, God, for knowing our hearts and 
revealing yourself to us and showing us the things that we need to see about ourselves so that in you, we are made whole. Thank you, Jesus, for this time of intercession. It is in your name that we pray, and we all agree saying, Well, if you have Bibles with you, I asked earlier, I wonder why the stage is up. And somebody said it was for the children yesterday. And wow, does that really give me an open arena to walk? <laughs> it's really nice. And if a number of you remember, six months ago, I couldn't do this. Do you remember that? Because the hip replacement was taking an awful long time to heal. And the knee surgery on the other side was giving me an awful lot of problems. So I'm very grateful that I can walk around on this stage. Very happy man to be able to do that. But this morning from Luke chapter 1, I'd encourage you, if you have a Bible, you might want to follow along. But the words will be on the screen behind me. And this is the Gospel of Luke that records the most thorough explanation of the birth of Jesus. Matthew records it. Mark says nothing. Not it is John. But Mark and Luke tell us about the origins, the beginning of Jesus' life. So this is uh, Luke, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 26. So this is the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. And we ask for our Lord's anointing upon this public reading of his holy word. This is the word of God. And thanks be to God. Have you ever paid a price for doing what you knew was right or good? Was there a cost for you in doing what you knew deep down in your soul was the right course of action. It was the thing to do. Cost you? Think of whistleblowers who come out to expose something in government, in business, in academia that somebody somewhere is trying to hide and the whistleblower comes out and sheds light on it. They lose a pile of friends. There's a cost there. You're going to do something like that? There's a cost. A lot of them lose their jobs. There's a cost. Some say, well, you're never going to hire it again. Who hires a whistleblower for doing that which was right? I've referenced him before, but my friend, Yang Min Hong. Yang Min Hong was one of my Korean students. I taught youth ministry and practical theology for 10 years at Wesley Seminary in D.C. I had a lot of Korean students. And family traditions run deep within the Korean community. And Yang Min Hong entered my office a broken man one day because he had, in his words, lost his family. The reason he lost his family 
is because his father made it abundantly clear that if he did not forget this trifle call to study theology at a seminary and would continue his graduate work in engineering and be a noted engineer like his father or his grandfather, he would not have any standing within the family. Now, that's a different cultural context, and I can't get my mind wrapped around that, but it's, it's a unique cultural context. So I understand it from that perspective. But young men couldn't shake his call from God. And he wanted to be obedient, yet knowing that in doing so, it was going to cost him. He remained in seminary. And he went home over his Christmas break to share with his family, only to be met by his father at the door to say, you are not welcome here. The last line tore him apart. You are dead to me. Could you say that to one of your kids? You are dead to me. I think of Albert Schweitzer, Nobel Peace Prize winner. At the age of 29, had everything in this world that anybody would say you should have to be considered successful. He was at the pinnacle of success. He was a world-renowned organist, was playing organ in front of large crowds as a child. A prodigy, yes, but his father was a noted organist, and he studied under the best. He would sustain himself and have lots to give away from all the concerts that he would hold because everyone wanted to hear Schweitzer play the organ. Different era. But he was a man of incredible intellect, secures his Ph.D. at a very young age, ends up being a tenured professor at St. Thomas Seminary, and then has done so well that at an early age, they move him to be the president of St. Thomas Seminary at 29. Who's the president of anything at 29, unless you're the CEO? I mean, maybe there's some exceptions around there or the founder of whatever it was it is, but he wasn't. He was just that brilliant. But he faced the scorn of his family and friends when he announced to them all that he was going to set all that aside to study medicine at the age of 30. Are you nuts? What is wrong with you? Who would leave this prestigious position having so much that the world says you have to have to be considered successful, who would let that go to study? You don't know a thing about medicine, and he didn't, but he had a call from God to go to the African outback where there was no medical community or services at all. He felt compelled in hearing the stories of people that would walk for days to receive any kind of medical treatment if there was anything for them to receive. And so he was willing to respond to this call of God that for him was fundamentally clear and others thought he was just nuts and told him that. So at the age of 30, he embarks in the study of medicine, ends up with another doctorate, becomes a medical doctor, takes all the income and wealth he had secured from his organ playing and invested it all in the medical services into the Congo and built a hospital. Well, others in the world took note of it. Nobel Peace Prize. Back in that era, in the first half of that 20th century, came a prize of $33,000 with the Nobel Award. <laughs> what, can you, what, what would $33,000 be? In, in, let's say even in the mid-20th century. What would that be worth today? Kyle, you're a financier. <laughs> You're a man of information. Kyle. <laughs> I totally agree. Thank you. Kyle's the chair of our finance committee. I thought he'd have that answer, and he did. So you know what he does with the 33000 Build another hospital. You're crazy. Do you realize the trips, the cruises, if they did cruises, though? Do you realize the stuff that you could do with $33,000? back in the mid of the 20th century. Oh, my. But he had such a passion for serving God, but it cost him a lot of relational connections. 
ever cost you to do that which you thought was right or good or following what you discern God was calling you to? Was there a price to be paid? Mary. Yeah, we're going to get on to Mary for sure. Thank God for Mary of Nazareth. Theotokos. That's what she is called, mother of God. And if it wouldn't have been for a Mary, and how at such an early age, scholars would contend a mid-teenager from our perspective, and her willingness to honor what God had said to her, the world would never be the same. But here is Mary, and when Mary, oh, by the way, if you, if, it's not that we've just eliminated the children's ministry as to why all the kids are coming in here. We release all the children to either the traditional service or this side, depending on where their parents are, so they can participate with families in the sacrament of communion, but that's a family's choice. Think of the cost to Mary. Well, I don't think, think about that too often, but think of the cost. She is what's called betrothed. Uh, engaged, even though, from our perspective, is more of a heightened engagement. They were actually considered married, but they had no physical contact whatsoever during the period of betrothal. So we would call this an engagement period, and she becomes pregnant. Guys in the room, you're engaged, and your fiance just slides up alongside of you one evening and says, I need to tell you. I'm pregnant. And you know you're not the father? Well, I'm asking the question rhetorically, but what might that response be like, gentlemen? <laughs> so much for rhetorical. <laughs> and God in God's grace informs Joseph. You know, Joseph was a man of great character, too. You know what he was going to do when he found out he didn't want to humiliate her or disgrace her publicly. Which, I would think, over 2,000 years ago, folks, how did would something like that play out? So he decides he's just going to divorce her because of the betrothal and the significance of it quietly. A man of character, because most men would never do anything like that. Ever. But God told him what was happening through the angel Gabriel. And he accepted the word. Think of the gossip that Mary would have been subject to. You know the thing about gossip is you can't ever stop it. Would you agree with that? I mean, no matter how hard you might try, you're not going to stop gossip. First of all, you don't even know how far it's gone. Gossip to rumoring people talking about you. Don't even know you. They just know of something about you. I'll tell you, in that small little community of Nazareth, it would have gotten out, wouldn't it? That Mary, betrothed to Joseph, is pregnant. No, they just couldn't wait. Mary, Joseph. It didn't get out. I mean, Joseph wasn't going to be saying that he wasn't the father. So Mary was pregnant, and Joseph took her to be his wife. And as far as the community was concerned, they had sexual contact outside of marriage. 2,000 years ago, that would have been gossip rich. Would you have been willing to pay that price? Because I suspect some of her friends bailed. Now the big one. Family. I've shared this before in the service because it just fascinates me. This is pure conjecture. This is not written in the word of God. But I understand family and human dynamics. I'm thinking that Mary goes home to speak to her family about this. And she informs her mom and dad that she has conceived and is pregnant. And mom and dad are... <gasps> and dad might say something like, well, I'm going to have a conversation with Joseph. Well, dad, you can, but Joseph isn't the father. So if you're Mary's dad, what's your next question? Who's the father? The Holy Spirit. 
How would that go down in your family? <laughs> would that be, oh, wonderful news. I'm so happy. God moved. I don't think so. I don't think that would have been well received. I'll tell you what I don't think it was. Uh, I think it would have been really tough for her family. But there was one family member who got it, and that family member's name was Elizabeth, who in the story that we read from Scripture was considered to be barren but was six months pregnant. She was carrying John. And scholars would tell us that Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. And it says in Scripture that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. And I always wonder what family lets their single, young, pregnant daughter go, even to another family member for three months, if there isn't tension within the home. I think there was a cost there, a cost that she willingly bore for the sake of obedience to the will and purposes of God in her life. You know, I'm thinking about Mary and Mary's obedience and Mary's character and Joseph's too. But you know, when isn't there a cost or a price in following Christ? Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you'll deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. I'm calling that a cost. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. There is a cost. Jesus said at the very end of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, say all kinds of evil things against you, speak evil of your good because of me, for you are blessed. They did the same thing to the prophets. There's a cost. So when you think about what the cost might be, what has your response been over the years to the claim and call of God upon your life? For some people, ah, it's too much. I can't stand the criticism. I'd receive this from kids sometimes that would go to our youth events, and they'd have a high and holy, profound moment with God at an outdoor event. They would come back home that week. Mom and dad weren't super excited. They'd go to school. Kids at school would ask them, how was your weekend? I had a tremendous weekend. I committed my life to Christ. Really? Seriously? Like, are you one of these Jesus freaks now? And some teens have just backed away for the cost of the criticism from peers and members of the family. You? Ever feel the weight, the cost, the price to be paid for being a follower of Christ? What has your response been? Well, you're sitting here. What will your response be? the claim and call of God. Upon your life. Thank God for Mary. And through the commitment of Mary and the faithfulness of Joseph, the Son of God was born. And Jesus lived among humankind. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The fullness of God dwelt within him in bodily form. We affirm that Jesus was both the Son of Man and the Son of God. God in human form come to us to give his life away. Remember, nobody took it. Jesus gave his life away and willingly hung on a cross, the cross, to redeem humanity. Timothy writes, or Paul writes, Timothy, it's God's desire that all people be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And the work of Christ on the cross is available to all humans throughout the course of time. Ours is to respond and to receive. While in the upper room with his disciples, sharing Passover meal together, Jesus took bread and he broke it. 
and he gave thanks to his father in heaven, and he passed it to each person at the table. There were only 11 at this time. For Judas had already left to betray him. There's a call. And he said to his disciples, present, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. And they received. And as they received, we're given the right and the opportunity to receive from his table, from these two tokens of his love. And following the bread, he took the cup. And once again, giving thanks to his father in heaven, passed the cup to each one present, saying, drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. And be thankful. And they did. They received. And we have the privilege to do the same as well. I'm going to ask communion stewards to please join me in the front today. As we have opportunity to receive from the table of the Lord... We always say that this is not the table of our congregation, not the table of any denomination. It's Jesus' table. And every faith family around the world would say the same, that these are the gifts extended to us through Jesus the Christ, who shed his blood and gave his life, that we might receive his and be thankful. Let's pray. Lord, we're very grateful for the opportunity we have to approach your table today. We approach as a faith family. We approach as respective families. That might mean I'm a single person, and I'm coming to receive from your table, acknowledging your love, grace, and sacrifice for each one of us. We come in humility with extended hands to receive from this bread and to receive from this cup. And to acknowledge, God, that you are ours and we are yours. Thank you, Lord, for this time of sharing in Jesus' name. Amen. And everyone who desires to be in fellowship with God and with one another is welcome to receive these two tokens of his love. There is a gluten-free element available for those who desire that. That will be with me at the center of the table. down through the aisles and then return by the outside arena. Thank you. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit come move Body over us. Come rest on Come rest on us, come 
rests on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down, spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down, spirit. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling 
and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, both now and forevermore. Shine bright, beloved. God bless you.